Television is a vast wasteland. That is how then Federal Communications Commission Chair Newton Minow characterized the state of television six decades ago. During his speech on May 9, 1961, Minow advocated for television that served the public's interest, criticizing programming for its blood, gore, and boredom, and its potential impact on children. Sixty years later, television has expanded from three commercial networks to seemingly unlimited channels delivered in brand new ways. This comes alongside the rise of social media and amid heightened distrust in the news media. Joining us to discuss the current state of television is Newton Minow himself, an advocate for educational television and champion of public service media. He's senior counsel at Sidley Austin and a member emeritus of the WTTW Board of Trustees. Newton Minow, thank you so much for joining us, of course, and welcome to your daughter, Nell Minow, who joins us sitting behind you as well. Glad to be with you, Brandis. So it has been six decades since that speech. Did you anticipate that your words would carry so much weight 60 years later? Oh, I had no idea. It's amazing to me that six decades later, but I think the issues, the issues uh, persist. And I think the issues for the next generation are the government's role in, the, in social media. Uh, I think the keeping broadcasters serving the public interest uh, being fair and, and reporting the news, uh, deciding what is a fact, that's the most important thing, not mixing fact with opinion, those, those questions remain. I think children's television has improved enormously, and I'm particularly proud to have played a role in getting Sesame Street started. Yes, and I want to come back to, to both of those things that you just mentioned, both Sesame Street, but also uh, the fact versus opinion uh, debate. But at the time, you know, television was, you know, groundbreaking technology. It was growing in popularity then. What was the reaction from the public, but also from those within the television industry? Well, the people in the industry didn't like it at all. <clears throat> but in fact, uh, the producer and writer of Gilligan's Island uh, was so irritated with me that he named the sinking ship the SS Minnow in Gil Gilligan's Island. And uh, we later had a wonderful correspondence about it. The reaction of the general public, particularly of, by parents of small children, was overwhelmingly possible. And you were also involved in the launch of WETA that broadcasts, of course, PBS NewsHour. Um, you were instrumental, as you said, in the creation of Sesame Street. Um, what made public television, which was at the time called educational television, what made that part of the solution to the problem then? Well, I went to the FCC from Chicago. Uh, President Kennedy went to the White House from Boston. Both of us were familiar with what was called educational television. Chicago had WTTW, Boston had WGBH, and we were astonished to find no such station in Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, no such station in New York, the nation's at that time biggest city, no such station in Los Angeles. And we, would, we determined to enlarge the number of channels and to make available opportunities to create what we now call public television and there are now 350 public television stations united into PBS across the nation. Some might say that we are living in sort of a golden age of television. We have so many streaming services and offerings. There is a lot of television to be consumed right now. But what would you say about the state of television now? Is it still a vast wasteland? Well, there's a lot of truth in that. And, and we, we did succeed in one thing, and that was to enlarge choice for the viewer. If you're a uh, sports junkie, you've got sports if you want 24 hours a day. If you're a news junkie, you, you've got news. If, if, if you like old movies as I do, you can find a station with old movies. So we've enlarged choice. And at the same time, I think, we have a serious problem in our news reporting where facts and opinion are mixed up together, where we no longer have an agreement on what is a fact. Let, let's get into that a little bit more. What is the antidote to um, disagreements on what is fact and what is opinion? 
Well, we have people who say we, we have alternative facts and make up the facts. If you don't agree on facts, I don't see how you can have a civilized discussion. Uh, Pat Moynihan, who I knew as a young person and later he became a senator, he put it all in one sentence. He said, this is a free country and everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but not to their own facts. And it seems to me today, that's a very critical issue in news reporting. If you were FCC chair. W, I'm proud to say, never mixes opinion and facts. They label when it is an opinion and they are always on truth on the facts. Thank you, Mr. Minow. That's something that we all work here to do. Um, if you were the chair of the FCC today, are there policies, steps that you would take to, to remedy that problem? I would go back to what we then had, what was called the Fairness Doctrine, which encouraged broadcasters to cover controversial issues, but to provide balances of opinion, and balances of not just presenting one point of view, but to, in fairness to provide all different points of view so that the viewer can make up his or her own mind. How would you say social media um, and the proliferation of media itself has impacted the current state of television? Well, I think young people, many of them don't even have a television set. They watch uh, streaming. I see that in my grandchildren. So I think it's the technology moves so quickly. It moves faster than public policy. What I, in the future, what I'm concerned about alternative, alternative intel, not alternative, uh, just a minute. Uh, it's, it's, it's artificial in, intelligence where they can take a person's picture, put words in the person's mouth, and you don't, they are different words than the person said. They can change the position of a person's face. All this is going to, is technologically possible today. And we have to have policies for artificial intelligence so that the viewer still gets the straight truth. You and our former colleague here at Chicago Tonight, Carol Marine, of course, you've known each other for years. Uh, she says that your wife, Jo, likes to keep you humble, particularly about this speech. Uh, how has your wife, Jo, helped to ground you over the years? <laughs> My wife and I have been, had a wonderful, happy marriage. This, this month will be our 72nd wedding anniversary. Uh, we've produced three great daughters, and have a simply marvelous family. And my wife has a terrific sense of humor and uh, keeps me grounded in everything I do. Well, congratulations on those 72 years of marriage. Um, uh, Mr. Minow, WTTW News uh, trustee, former chair Jim Maybe. We know that he passed away recently, serving as a trustee here for more than 20 years. He was also a champion for public media. What impact would you say he made on WTTW? Jim, uh, I, I, I was so shocked and saddened to learn of his passing uh, today. Jim and I were very good friends. We worked together for years. He was not only the chairman of TTW, he was also the chairman of WBEZ, the public radio station in Chicago. He was devoted to the public interest. He cared about the independent news gathering. And he was a model citizen who was devoted to bringing the arts, music, art to Chicago. He, he couldn't have been a better American or better citizen than Chicago. And our condolences, and of course, we'll have more uh, on Jim's uh, legacy later on in the program. But uh, while we've still got you, uh, the Chicago Tribune's ownership is currently in flux with uh, hedge fund Alden Global, but reporters are pushing back. Mr. Minow, what are your thoughts on the impact that this could all have on local news in Chicago? Well, I love newspapers. In fact, I've been a member of the board of directors of the Chicago Tribune, the Chicago Sun-Times, the Chicago Daily News, and I see, sadly, that newspapers are in big trouble. Uh, the newspaper uh, is essential in a democracy as a guardian of, uh, for the public of being a, uh, a uh, critic or supporter, whatever is appropriate, of the government. Mostly, it's, it's got to be a watchdog of the government. 
So I pray for the Tribune and, and the Sun-Times and all newspapers to continue, but I worry that the technolo technological revolution has created the printed newspaper into a terrible, terrible corner. And, and lastly, uh, Mr. Minow, the speech, obviously, that we're noticing the anniversary of right now, is this what you would like to be remembered by or your many other accomplishments as well? If I could be remembered for one thing, I would hope it would be for helping to build the public broadcasting service in America. I'm, I'm very, very proud of that. All right. Our thanks. I'm even more proud of my family. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you are, and congrats on your family as well. Our thanks to Newton Minow. It's a privilege to have you here for joining us. Thank you so much. Candace, thank you.